I slept in this thing, I wore this in 95 degree heat, I wore it all the time. Ah, the corset, the bane of every pre-20th century woman's existence, a symbol of repression, oppression, suppression, of patriarchy and shifted organs. I can't even take myself jokingly seriously with all this nonsense. Hi, as some of you probably already know, I wore one of these things for the better part of my remembered youthful years to treat a case of scoliosis, and surprisingly, I haven't died. I haven't so much as even fainted, ever. Considering how many of these I wore a corset for a day videos I'm seeing popping up out there, I decided I had to partake. Only, I thought I'd add my scoliostic historian's two cents to this by taking the opportunity to explore and compare corset life in the medical brace I am accustomed to versus life in an actual Victorian reproduction corset. How are they similar? How are they different? Can you put your shoes on after putting on your corset? All these important questions and more coming up. The first task of the day is, of course, getting dressed. So one thing I actually figured out independently, which turns out is a historically accurate practice, is how important it is to be wearing a layer underneath this thing. I'm pretty sure this is common sense, but I feel like it's something that you just come to naturally when you realize, wow, having a tight garment against your skin is not ideal. So automatically I adopted the practice of wearing a chemise or basically like a camisole or an under t-shirt or just something that went underneath this brace. This not only prevented chafing, but it helped keep my skin cooler. I mean, this is plastic, so this is not Victorian, obviously, not what they would have to deal with. I will say, um, I did wear this like all day, all the time, all day, every day, 20, three and a half hours of the day when I wasn't changing my clothes or taking a shower. So I slept in this thing. I wore this in 95 degree heat. I wore it all the time and I never even thought about it because it just like it wasn't even there it was just part of the way that I move and part of the way that I live and adapt one thing that's really great about all corsetry including this is that you can wear your waistbands really tight against your abdomen you can get a really nicely fit waistband without worrying about it cutting in I know personally I mean I know this sounds really contradictory but I can't stand having constrictive waistbands. It's not like you have one waistband just cutting into your waist, which is not very comfortable. So I should disclaim, I'm not supposed to be wearing this thing. If you happen to be my orthopedic surgeon once upon a time, please do not watch this video. Alright, it is time to get to work. I'm working on another project that's computer-based. I will get to some more, slightly more upright activities this afternoon. It is also potentially interesting to see what happens when you have to sit for long periods of time in a corset. The answer is... not much. I will say in regards to posture, because this is a question that comes up a lot with corsetry, at least with this thing, this thing is hard plastic, so yes, my posture is very much improved. I also want to say that this is no effort whatsoever. It's not a conscious effort that I'm sitting up straight now, it's just- I mean, this is also possibly a little bit of the detriment of this in that because I've got this coming all the way up to here, all the way up to the crook of my arm basically, I mean, I just kind of rest on it. And I'm like, at this point, I'm completely slouched and relaxed. I'm just totally and entirely held up by the support of the hard plastic, which is why they tell you not to wear these things for the rest of your life, because this will deteriorate your muscles, and it did, which is part of the reason why I have residual issues now. So needless to say, I'm actually quite comfortable. <laughs> Hello, it's lunchtime. I'm making grilled cheese. So inevitably something that everybody asks in regards to corsetry is what do you do about food? How do you eat whilst you wear something that's constrictive around you? Yes, you are prevented from expanding. 
physically to some degree, especially, I mean, with what I'm wearing here, this is hard plastic. This does not have any give to it. I do want to say everyone is different on this subject. Everyone who wears a corset is comfortable with different levels of strain, I guess. So there are some people who can wear a corset, who can eat just normally as they would every day, even uncorseted, and they're fine. I am not that kind of person. I know Abby Cox has said on her channel, I believe, when she was talking about dressing 18th century, how they all go out to a restaurant in their 18th century wear, and at the end of the meal, all the women would lean in a way to get the pressure off their abdomen so that they could have a little bit more of more expanding room, uh, which is clever. It's not something that I ever figured out. Personally, I do not like the feeling of feeling full whilst wearing something around my middle. I eat very, very small portions, but frequently throughout the day. So generally, and this is something that I do even now that I am no longer wearing a corset, I focus on consuming dense, high calorie foods that I don't have to consume large quantities of, but they, that can sustain me until like when I eat again in like two or three hours. <laughs> so typically it depends on what time I get up in the morning, but if I'm up around six or seven, I'll have breakfast then, and then I'll have second breakfast around 10 or 11, and then I'll have lunch at like midday. And then I will have like afternoon tea, like another thing in the middle of the afternoon, then I will have dinner. And depending on what time I have dinner, if I have dinner late, then I won't eat anything late at night. But if I eat dinner more like six or seven o'clock, then I will have another snack before I go to sleep. So it's about quarter to two o'clock right now. I have to go out and post a letter real quick. I also feel like I want to take you on adventures outside. We'll go on a little adventure real quick and then I have to get back here to do some sewing that I have to start doing before I start losing the light because it is fast approaching winter. And that's a thing that tends to happen, so. Friends, I have to confess, the one and only point of pain that I am feeling right now is the underwire of my modern bra. So when I put out a little poll on Instagram to ask, what are the questions that you have about corset life? How do you do that in life? Almost every single question has something to do with movement. How do you bend over? How do you sleep? How do you do this? How, how do you put on your shoes? Virtually everything is still possible. You do definitely lose a, a range of movement. Obviously I can't bend the lower half of my spine, like I can't curve my back like that. However, we forget that the human body is capable of moving in many different directions. So if you need to bend over, well, you have the option of bending at the waist. You have the option of bending at the shoulders. You have the option of bending with your knees. So there are many different ways to still perform the same activities. You just do them in a slightly different way. And it's all something that happens very naturally, very instinctually and very intuitively. If you are used to doing all of your bending just in this lower part of your spine, you will notice a difference in the way that you are moving. It is not constrictive though, because you're not being prevented from making these movements. You can still do them. You just have to use another part of your body to do that. So I had absolutely no issue putting on my shoes. I had absolutely no issue bending over to pick things up. We're sitting in all sorts of weird, unnatural positions, as some of us are so wont to do, and I was still able to do all of that perfectly fine. Comfort update, I guess. I mean, it's gotten to the point where like, I'm starting to forget that it's here. There are a couple of bother spots. One, this underwire spot is still driving me insane. The other thing that I'm starting to notice is this bit here where it cuts in, starting to cut into one of the back muscles that I have developed since I stopped wearing this thing. This is an issue that's specific to this brace and this is why I'm not supposed to be wearing it still, but 
Just thought I'd point that out. So usually around this point of the afternoon, it's about four o'clock, I will stop and do a bit of exercise. Typically, I will do the physio exercises that I'm meant to be doing. However, unfortunately, these are movements that I specifically cannot do whilst I am in this thing because they are designed to move the bits that I can't move whilst I'm in this thing. So I can't exactly do that. So fortunately, I do live in an environment with lots of stairs. So let's go see how we handle stairs. I in no way feel like I'm going to pass out. I'm just, you know, walked up some stairs, but I'm fine. For those of you who wanted to know, yes, Cesario is in fact using his pillow. I did just wake him up from a nap though, so. So in my evening hours, I spend these importing all of my footage into my computer that I shot during the day, as well as going through it, labeling it, doing scripting, all that sort of processing stuff just because, I mean, today I, I was actually working on two videos simultaneously. Well, I mean, three. So that's a lot of um, little individual bits and files and things that need to be sorted. Otherwise, I'm just going to end up with a massive mess of footage, which zero out of 10. Do not like to deal with that, as one Morgan Donner would say. Still not dead. It is day two of the experiment, and having been sufficiently reminded of the day-to-day -day life in the brace, it is now time to find out how life in a Victorian corset compares. The corset I'm wearing today is a reconstruction of an 1890s corset based on a pattern from the Symington collection. This was an actual pattern used by the Symington Corset Company, which operated out of Market Harbour, England, throughout the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th. The mass manufacture nature of the Symington Company means that the corsets that they produced would have been inexpensive and thus affordable to a wider range range of women in the latter Victorian period. In fact, the Symington Company is perhaps best known for its pretty housemaid corset, which was marketed specifically to women working in domestic service as being a particularly durable, supportive, and yet lightweight undergarment. While the original Symington corset would have been stiffened with baleen or whalebone amongst a range of other possible materials, I've stiffened this reproduction with synthetic baleen, a particular quality of plastic bone that is made to mimic the exact weight and flexibility of real baleen. There's an entire two-part video series on the making process for this if you wish to learn a bit more about that. Compared to yesterday, I am comfortable. <laughs> Not that yesterday was uncomfortable because obviously I did wear that for many years. I am used to it. It is made for me. This is fantastic. This is like, I mean, to be quite honest, this feels like sportswear in comparison to what I was wearing yesterday. I do feel a little bit lumpy up here. I should be wearing some ruffles underneath as well as a corset cover just to smooth the edge of the corset here going up. So this harsh line, I do not possess currently the proper undergarments to solve that, but that, this would not be historically desirable, I should say. This one actually is a little bit more difficult on the breathing just because the one, the brace that I was wearing yesterday is under bust, so it stopped here. It did come up a bit further up in the back, but this provides bust support. That is the point of a corset. So this comes up obviously all the way around here, which means it constricts a bit more around the upper part of my ribs. I can breathe fairly deeply, but I have to sort of, it's, the only way I can describe it is like conical breathing. Like you breathe the most up top and you just sort of funnel it down into the lower part of your lungs. So it's not that I can't breathe deeply, I definitely can. It's just a different process than what I'm used to. I should point out, by the way, that I am not tight-laced. There is a difference between wearing a corset as a supportive undergarment and tight lacing for the benefit of fashion. So I am not tight laced. I'm not cinching myself down to a 21 inch, 18 inch waist. I have laced this just so that it is snug enough so that it doesn't move around. 
on me because that will be uncomfortable, but it's not so tight as to constrict me unnecessarily. I don't want to say these corsets are restrictive, I should say, in regards to movement because this whalebone is really quite flexible, especially when it starts to heat up against the heat of your body, it starts to soften up a bit. Historically, whalebone, real whalebone, I mean it's keratin, it's like fingernail and hair material, so it does soften up with heat and with moisture, which sitting against your skin, it will do that. So not only will it become softer whilst you wear it, but it will also start to mold to the shape of your body. So you will end up with a custom fitted corset the more that you wear a whalebone corset. This is really quite flexible. I can kind of bend and do all the like weird torso movements that I definitely could not do yesterday. I will say sewing in a corset is nice back support. Not that sewing is like physically strenuous work, but you do, I'm sure if you sew, you know, you find yourself often leaning quite precariously over your work, which after a couple of hours when you don't realize you're doing it, really hurts. The hard plastic brace yesterday definitely kept me very straight up, but even on the flexible whalebone corset, this is actually kind of the best of both worlds because you do get the flexibility of the whalebone, so I can still move, I do still have that freedom of movement. However, there is a big steel busk down the front of it, as you probably saw when I was putting this on, so that is less flexible. It still does have some give to it, so there is a very strong reminder every time I do go to bend over like that, wait, Maybe we should not. I will say though, there was a brief period where I was still wearing my brace whilst I was working on Broadway in theater, and I was made to carry around, obviously, lots of heavy fabric, lots of heavy costumes all over the city, and it was never something that phased me. I know I look small and weak, but um, I would always manage these quite heavy loads perfectly fine. It wasn't so much like my own physical strength, so much as that I had the ability to balance that strength over this extra reinforcement support over my core, which was really useful. So how's that for corsetry, turning women into small, delicate, weak, crippled things? In a weird way, they actually make you stronger, not in a physical sense, not in the sense that these are actually my own muscles, but the corset itself does provide you an extra layer of strength, which is a bit counterintuitive to our modern narrative of corsetry. I always like to devote at least an hour or two each week to taking an online course, so I'm getting off my feet for a bit this afternoon to do just that. This video is conveniently sponsored by Skillshare, who are one of my favorite online learning platforms and who I visit regularly for my weekly learning adventures. Today's selection is a course by Soledad O'Brien called Powerful Storytelling Today, Strategies for Crafting Great Content, which immediately caught my eye since, I don't know, I feel like I talk about this endlessly, but mastering the craft of storytelling is so deeply important to literally anything that you do, whether it's your job to create engaging online content, or even just existing as a person in the world and interacting with other humans. We as a species rely on story to derive meaning from life, and this is getting way too philosophical, but basically storytelling is one of those nebulous creative skills that I am perpetually exploring. Skillshare specialize in creative and business-oriented content, not only to help you build skills in creative fields, but also to help you market those skills if that is something you choose to pursue. With skill-based courses in painting, drawing, photography, videography, and even sewing, to productivity, time management, presentation skills, business analytics, leadership, and management. So whether you're looking to stave off boredom productively or work towards a particular goal in your creative skill set, Skillshare offers the perfect creative learning community to help you. The first 1,000 people to click the link in the description box below will get a free trial of Skillshare's premium membership, and after that it's only around $10 per month. So I think it is time to now attempt a bit of exercise. Now, in theory, I think I actually do have a bit more core movement here. So I could potentially do some of the physio exercises that I'm supposed to be doing. However, I think it would be a bit more fun to attempt some Victorian exercises. I have actually, my good friend Constance McKenzie has sent me a link to a 1910 Every Woman's Encyclopedia in which is contained some instructions for some basic exercises, so I thought we would give this a shot today. It's really interesting because this article actually has pictures in it showing actual photographs of a Victorian woman doing these exercises, and you can see she has got quite a bit of core bending and movement going on. She's not as rigid as 
I definitely felt and definitely was in the brace. This of course is obviously due to the flexibility of whalebone, even if she's got steels in her course of that still does have some give to it. So let's see what sort of exercises the Victorians were getting up to. So this first one is instructing me to stand with heels together, arms horizontal with the shoulders, and bend alternately to the left and to the right sides. With hands on hips and heels together, bend as far back as possible at the waist, recover original position, and bend forward at the waist. Seems simple enough. Figure 3. With arms raised above the head and heels together, bend alternately as far as possible to the right and left sides. Hands above the head and bend the body at the waist until the toes can be touched. Seems pretty straightforward enough. Hold a stick in both hands, stretch to the right, swinging downwards and upwards to the left on the balls of the toes. I'm not gonna lie, that was not unaffected. I can see why it's having you do all these vertical stretches because when you stretch vertically, you lengthen out, which means that your core muscles are more engaged in doing the actions, if that makes any sense. So for example, when I'm lengthening myself like this and I'm giving myself a bit more room in the corset and then I go and lean, all of a sudden these back muscles have to do some work. So I, I definitely do feel it. I feel it in my lower back muscles. I feel it in my shoulder blades when I was having to do some of those more like upper stretches. It's also really interesting to do these exercises not in a rigid garment that prevents movement but in one that does allow for some flexibility because as i'm pushing against the corset it does have give but it has resistance so in a weird way i almost feel like my core muscles are having to work harder which is a good thing because obviously just having them be supported for their entire life is not a good thing so i actually may or may not be adopting some of these in my everyday routine we shall see Hello friends, editing Bernadette coming here to you to report that I'm real heckin' sore after doing that workout routine thing. A, one, because I am a weakling. I'm feeling it like here, like in my back, round my waist area, which is not a muscle I even realized I had, let alone used. So you go Victorian ladies, they're using muscles that I don't even use apparently in my own everyday uncorseted life. Okay, well after sufficiently spending a day in this thing, I have to say, I do not hate it. In fact, I have actually grown quite comfy in it, and I could 10 out of 10 definitely see wearing one of these things in everyday life. So what can we conclude? I actually have to say, the brace is more severe, more rigid, less flexible, and more painful than the Victorian corset. Which is surprising because, I mean, in theory, the brace is something that I'm used to. It's something that I've worn. It's something that I tolerated very easily that I wore basically every hour of the day. Whereas the Victorian corset that gets so much modern day flack for being this horrendously repressive, uncomfortable, restrictive garment was actually far more freeing than what I actually wore every day of my life for a period. That was a bit of a revelation, actually. I do also have to say that because the Victorian corset was so flexible, I was not supported. I wasn't held up by the Victorian corset in the way that I was held up by the brace. In the brace, as you saw, I was able to sort of basically just sort of slouch and lean into it. That's, of course, what has caused such intense deterioration of all my core strength. Whereas I still had a lot of core flexibility with the Victorian corset and I could not just sort of like lean back on it and be supported. I did have to keep myself upright. So even I will admit that I was under the impression that, oh wow, Victorian women must have had very weak core muscles because I have very weak core muscles after growing up in a corset. I think I've busted that myth a bit for myself in that the Victorian corset was not nearly so restrictive as the brace. And also if she's not sleeping in it, if she is taking it off during the day, which I was not, on top of the fact that women were obviously encouraged to exercise, especially to exercise in a manner that engaged their core muscles, in terms of breathing, as I said, I do feel like it was a bit easier to breathe in the brace just because it's sort of cut off right here-ish. The Victorian corset came up a bit higher, therefore there was more of me compressed. It wasn't at all in any case detrimental. It wasn't impeding. It was just 
readapting to the method of breathing that I became adapted to once upon a time. Once you get used to it, I honestly, genuinely forgot that the corset was there. I will say with the brace, I was aware of it pretty much every hour of the day. I really wish I could recall the first week of wearing this thing and what adjustments I was making. I don't recall ever feeling any sort of antipathy towards it. I was never reluctant or resistant to wearing it, but I do imagine the first week or two would have been a bit of an adjustment. So just getting back into it for one day, I was very conscious of the fact that I was wearing this brace again. I'm like mentally putting myself back into somewhere I thought I had left. With the Victorian corset, however, I will say I genuinely forgot about it by the end of the day. There were moments where I was like, oh yeah, I'm doing this thing. I guess I need to pick up the camera and vlog because it's just not there. It was comfortable. It was really comfortable. I mean, I've said this in the past before. It's kind of like just having a, like, like a hug, just a permanent hug. Honestly, they're really not that bad, friends. Eating was definitely easier in the Victorian corset. Again, the Victorian corset has so much more flexibility to it. Um, and also the brace sort of cuts in severely at very odd places. And so, yeah, okay. It doesn't exactly make things the most easy, but with the not tight laced, very functionally laced, very naturally done corset, it was fine. I was wearing an 1890s corset. By this time in history, Women had been wearing corsets and stays and bodies and kirtles for literally hundreds of years. The technology for these things was extremely developed and extremely advanced. So whereas at one point in the 17th century, the entire pair of stays was just solidly boned with tiny, tiny little slivers of baleen and were very rigid. They were stiffened with paper and paste and all this sort of stiffening additional material. By the time you reach the late Victorian period, which is the kind of course that I was wearing for this experiment, people have figured out that you don't need to just encase yourself in a wall of bones. You can actually achieve a really supportive shape and a really comfortable shape in the cutting of the fabric itself rather than in the stiffening of the material. And this is something that we seem to have forgotten in modern corsetry construction nowadays in that we think, oh, we'll just put steel bones in everything and we will have a beautifully hourglass shape. It doesn't work like that. If you saw my corset making video, the shape of the fabric pieces themselves, the curves and the way that they fit together alone without the boning already have such incredible shape. The boning just sort of keeps it vertical so that when you put it on, it doesn't smoosh. Like that. This was not meant to be a super fashionable Camille Clifford, let's see how tiny I can get my 18 inch waist or whatever. That was not the point. I imagine, yes, there would be some detrimental effects from wearing corsetry in that effect. Yes, your organs move. Yes, things shift around. No, it's not harmful to your health. Pregnancy, obesity, etc. Things shift around, just as when you wear a corset, but they shift back when you take the corset off. Everything goes right back to normal, according to the x-rays that these people have done. The only instance in which organs do shift is if you are severely tight lacing from a very young age. I mean, in a weird way, in scoliosis treatment, that is deliberate. The whole point of scoliosis treatment is to catch the strangeness of body growth whilst you are young so that you can deliberately try and change the composition of things by the time you are finished growing. Anyway, thank you for joining me on this quest. I hope this was informative and I shall see you anon with some more dress history hype and general nerdery, okay? 